Hello everyone, my name is Asim and my friend Hubert. We are going to present this talk about distributed snapshots and global deadlock detector today. The subject of this talk is a system comprising of multiple Postgres instances. Each Postgres instance storing part of a larger data set. And the goal is to achieve parallel query execution, thereby giving us faster results to queries that otherwise would take hours or days to run. And typically this is known as sharding. So before we jump into the talk, a quick note about the speakers. Hubert is based in Beijing, China, and I am based in Pune, India. We both work at VMware, and our job is to hack on Greenplum database. And Greenplum database is a fork of Postgres SQL. The sharded system that we are concerned with today comprises of a few foreign servers connected with Postgres FTW. We shall see in this system how easy it is to get wrong results. And we will see a solution by means of distributed snapshots that solves this problem and achieves correct results. Then Hubert will lead us through uh, steps to realize how easy it is to get into deadlock and how built-in deadlock detection capabilities of Postgres are not sufficient in such a setup. Let's look at the setup in detail. We have a master Postgres instance and two server, two foreign servers. They both are connected with Postgres FTW. And all transactions that we are seeing in this talk are initiated on master. And the commands within those transactions are dispatched to the foreign servers. Let us see how sharding can be achieved with this setup. What we have here is a partition table foo. It's partitioned by hash on column A and two partitions, each mapping to the two servers, server one and server two. The last insert statement here inserts 100 tuples to foo into foo. And roughly half of those tuples are routed to server one and the remaining half to server two because of the hash partitioning strategy. So that's how we achieve sharding. Now, in such a setup, it's really easy to get wrong results. So let's consider two concurrent transactions interleaved in the way shown on this slide. The first transaction inserts one tuple that gets routed to server one. The second transaction inserts two tuples to foo and they get routed to server one and server two each. The second transaction commits and the first transaction runs uh, select. According to the read, uh, repeatable read isolation level, the select, uh, on, uh, the, the select statement should see only the results of transaction one. It should not see the results of transaction two because it is in future with respect to the repeatable read snapshot. We'll see what really happens here. But a quick note about this repeatable read isolation level. We have chosen it because Postgres FTW uses repeatable read isolation level on foreign servers. Let's take a quick look at how this really happens. Let me show you the setup briefly. As you can see, we have three servers, Postgres servers running, one master and two foreign servers. Let me connect to the master. Let's say this is our transaction T1. Begin isolation level. Insert in full. As we can see, this transaction 
this insert was routed to server 1. Now let's start another transaction on the right hand side. Begin isolation. Insert three values one transaction two. And as we can see, this also went to server one. Let's insert another two. And this one went to server two. So notice that transaction one on the left has not yet reached server two. And we are going to commit transaction two. And now let's run select star for foo. Wrong results. We should not have seen the transaction 2, the tuple inserted by transaction 2. But we actually saw it. So let us see what really is happening here. But before we get into the details, let's recap what a snapshot is. The most truthful definition of the snapshot is in front of us, so captured from the source snippet. The snapshots are used to determine whether a tuple being read is visible to the current transaction or not. And the snapshot only uh, defines a limit, the oldest transaction uh, that uh, th that is seen as uh, running. So the xmin value here uh, in this snapshot means that uh, all transactions that are older than xmin are visible to the snapshot and all transactions that are newer than xmin are invisible to the snapshot. So the basic idea is all the transactions that were committed at the time this snapshot was taken should be visible to the snapshot. And when a transaction inserts a tuple, its transaction ID is recorded in the tuple. And when some other transaction wants to read data, read the tuple, that tuple's transaction ID, which is tuple.xmin, if it is committed, it is evaluated against the reading transactions snapshot. So if that reading transactions snapshot xmin is newer than the tuple xmin, then the tuple is visible to the snapshot. Otherwise, the tuple is not visible. So with that information, let's look into why we got wrong results. Let's focus on one server at a time. So on server one, transaction T1 arrived first. It inserted uh, the, the tuple and it got 100, let's say, as the transaction ID. Transaction T2 arrived next and it got trans uh, transaction ID as 101. And then transaction T2 committed and then the select statement from transaction T1 reached server 1. So this select, when it scans tuple 100, the, the tuple with XID 100, it sees that this is the same transaction as us. So it is visible. But when it reads the tuple with transaction ID 101, it, it compares it with the snapshot and the repeatable read snapshot was acquired before uh, the transaction T2 started. So definitely the repeatable read snapshot indicates that this tuple is not visible. So we got correct results on server 1. But let's see what happens on server 2. On server 2, transaction T2 arrived first. It got transaction ID as 200. And then the T2 transaction committed and the select statement of transaction T1 arrived on server 2. And this is because this is the first time 
the transaction T1 arrived on server 2, it got a new snapshot and that snapshot would see transaction T2 as committed on server 2 because the snapshot is being acquired after the T2 has committed and therefore T2 is visible to T1. So the tuple is incorrectly visible. The tuple with A equals 3 is incorrectly visible to the select query executed by T1. What's the root cause of this problem? The root cause is we are using inconsistent snapshots across different foreign servers in the same cluster. So let's see how we solve this. One approach to solving this is to use exactly the same snapshot across all the clusters. Nobody else is allowed to create a new snapshot. Right, so this approach of global transaction ID service is employed by Postgres Excel. There are a couple of problems with it. The global transaction ID service becomes a single point of failure and contention. And then the participating Postgres instances, they lose their identity as independent Postgres instances. In our setup, each foreign server acts as a Postgres uh, instance by itself. So you can initiate transactions directly on the foreign servers and they will work just fine. But that ability is lost by the solution and we don't want that to happen. So we propose another solution which is distributed snapshots wherein every foreign server retains its individual identity and yet we use the same snapshot across the foreign servers uh, to determine triple visibility. And this happens by master creating distributed transaction IDs and master also creating something called as distributed snapshots based on the distributed transaction IDs. And uh, on the foreign servers, the tuples continue to record local transaction ID, which is the default transaction ID generated by the foreign servers. But the foreign servers maintain a mapping between local and the corresponding distributed transaction ID for a for any given transaction so let's see a bit more detail about this solution so how does the visibility check work on a foreign server with this setup with this setup first thing is master assigns a distributed transaction id as well as distributed snapshot and distributed snapshot is nothing but it is identical to the local snapshot that we just saw just that the transaction IDs are all distributed transaction IDs. They are generated using the distributed transaction ID counter on master. So master includes the distributed transaction ID as well as the snapshot along with the query that it sends to a foreign server. And upon arrival, foreign server creates a local snapshot. And so the foreign server has both the distributed snapshot as well as local snapshot at its disposal. And then the triple visibility logic is that if the foreign server can map a local transaction ID to its distributed transaction ID, then it uses distributed snapshot. But if the mapping does not exist, then, we, then it uses local snapshot to determine visibility. So, how does this mapping really work? Let's focus on one foreign server here. So it let, let's, uh, the example indicates that there are two transactions, A and B, and local transaction ID for A assigned by this foreign server is 20, and for B it is, uh, for, sorry, for A it is 10 and B it is 20, which means that on this foreign server, transaction A arrived before transaction B. However, the distributed transaction ID for A is 550 and B is 500, which means that transaction B was created on master before transaction A. And therefore, this server should interpret that transaction B 
receives transaction A, even if the local transaction ID or even if the order in which they arrived at this server was different. Right? So transaction A does not precede B. In fact, transaction B precedes A. So distributed snapshots and distributed transaction IDs take precedence. Now let us see how this solves the problem, going back to the previous example. So let's focus on server 1 again. And because transaction T1 was created before T2 on master, transaction T1 would get distributed transaction ID as let's say 5 and T2 would get uh, distributed transaction ID as 6. So same thing as before, let's say the select statement of transaction T1 when it arrives server 1, it sees transaction ID as 100, the tuple with transaction ID as 100, and that's our own transaction, so it is visible. But when it looks at the tuple with transaction ID 101, it reverse maps the tuple, uh, the transaction ID 101 to the corresponding distributed transaction ID, which happens to be 6. And then it uses the distributed snapshot to determine tuple visibility. And according to distributed snapshot, because T1 was created on master first, uh, T2 is in future with respect to T1, T1's snapshot. So T2 is not visible. So distributed transaction ID 6 is not visible. And so we got correct results just as before on server 1. Let's see the story on server 2. On server 2, when the select statement from transaction T1 arrives. It sees transaction ID 200, the tuple with transaction ID 200, and it was inserted by T2. It maps the 200 to distributed transaction ID, which is 6. And according to the distributed snapshot, 6 is in future. So it should not be visible. And therefore, T2 is not visible to T1. So we have consistent visibility across all the foreign servers. So now that we have seen that distributed snapshot solved the problem, let's focus more on the mapping. How long should the mapping last? Notice that the transaction ID counters are monotonically increasing. The, even the distributed transaction ID, so in a system, transactions keep on happening continuously and the transaction ID counters are moving forward. So in that context, how long should this mapping be maintained between distributed and local transaction ID? So let's go over a few axioms. The first one is XIDs are monotonically increasing. We just uh, realized that. The second axiom is distributed transaction ID is committed or aborted only after local transaction IDs on all servers are committed or aborted. Third axiom is distributed snapshots arriving at foreign servers are first created on master. Right? Otherwise, uh, foreign servers do not have the capability of created, creating distributed snapshots. That's the assumption we have. So with that assumptions or axioms, we are proposing a theorem, which is if a distributed transaction is older than the oldest running distributed transaction, its local transaction ID is sufficient to determine visibility. So let's, let's look into an example to realize what this means. If we have a distributed snapshot with x minus 7, what that means is the oldest still running transaction ID as seen by this snapshot is 7. Now let's consider an older transaction which is 6 and let it be committed on master. Now since this uh, transaction is older than the oldest transaction seen by the snapshot, it clearly means that this transaction is finished. It is no longer seen as running anywhere in the cluster. And what that means is, so if we are assuming that 6 is committed on master, it must be also committed on all the servers. And when such a snapshot reaches, let's say, server 1, 
the server one creates a local snapshot corresponding to this and let's say it assigns uh, x min as 220 now what we are saying here is the 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 distributed transaction id or the rather the local transaction id that corresponds to the transaction 6 on server 1 it must be older than uh, the xmin for this local snapshot what that means is because distributed transaction id 6 is already committed it can no longer be seen as running by any foreign server in the system and therefore we do not need the distributed snapshot to evaluate the visibility so if a triple is inserted by distributed transaction as 6 on server 1 the local snapshot acquired by server 1 is sufficient to determine the visibility you don't need the mapping at all for older transactions so that's what the theorem tries to suggest that uh, if a transaction is older than the oldest transaction seen as running then uh, it does not its mapping does not need to be maintained a quick recap we saw that distributed uh, snapshots solve the problem of triple visibility distributed transaction id as well as the snapshot is created on master and then sent to the servers along with the statement and servers need to maintain foreign servers need to maintain a mapping between local and distributed transaction id for determining the visibility and all of this is based on the assumption that the assumption of atomicity that when a distributed transaction id is committed it means that it is definitely all the local transaction ids that were part of this transaction are seen as committed by all the foreign servers involved in this transaction which today we do not have and coincidentally there is a patch under discussion on pg sql hackers proposing just this and with that i would like to end the first part of this talk and hand it over to hubert thank you thanks asim hi everyone I'm very honored and happy to pair with Asim and give this talk on PGCon 2020. My name is Hubert Zhang. I worked at VMware as a database kernel developer. I'm also the PMC member of Apache Hawk, which is a PostgreSQL based SQL on Hadoop engine. I'm the author of PR Container, which enabled to run PostgreSQL procedure language instead of container runtime. I will follow a same topic, distributed snapshot, and continue to introduce global dialogue detector. Below is the outline of today's talk. Let's start with a single node dialogue example. Suppose there are two concurrent Postgres sessions. Each session is a Postgres backend process. At the beginning, Process 1 hold log A and process 2 hold log B. Then process 1 want to acquire log B and process 2 want to acquire log A. Given the fact that logs are normally released at the end of the transaction, the local dialog happens. So how about the dialog in a distributed cluster? What is the difference between cluster and single node? Let's start with an example. Here, we have a cluster with one master node and two slave nodes. Suppose we got two concurrent distributed transactions. Distributed transaction one firstly run on node A, and distributed transaction two run on node B. Then, transaction 1 want to run on node B, which is blocked by transaction 2. 
So distributed transaction one will harm. Meanwhile, suppose transaction two also try to run on segment A, which is blocked by transaction one. Then distributed transaction two will harm as well. So dialogue happens. Note that there is no dialogue on either node A or node B, but we do have a dialogue. From the perspective of master node, this is a so-called global dialogue. Now, let's say a more concrete Postgres FTW cluster example. Here, we have two foreign servers, which act as a row of slave nodes on Lassa slide. On master Postgres server, we create a partition table with one partition on foreign server A and one partition on foreign server B. Then we insert some rows. Some of them are on server A and some others are on server B. Then we run the following update queries on two concurrent sessions. Query one, two, three, four and four. We could see that both the two sessions are hung due to the dialogue. But local Postgres dialogue detector on each foreign server cannot detect them. So how to resolve this kind of dialogue issue? The answer is to introduce the global dialogue detector in your distributed system. In this talk, we will propose an idea about how to implement global dialogue detector in Postgres foreign server cluster. But the concept is common and could be a reference to other kinds of Postgres cluster implementation. In fact, we refer to global dialogue detector in group plan a lot. Firstly, it's better to implement global dialogue detector as a Postgres background worker which is more like a PG feature. Secondly, we propose a centralized detector, which means we only have a single worker on master to gather transaction with for relationship and detect the dialogue periodically. Note that in Postgres local dialogue detector, its waiter process responsibility to detect the dialogue since we just use one detector process, the detector must do a full width for graph search to detect the dialogues. This requires a better algorithm to detect the dialogue, since find circles for each vertex is not an effective way. Global dialogue detector also uses the width for graph to model a blocking relationship. But it has some difference with Postgres 1. Firstly, the width for graph is built on top of the whole cluster, not a single node. So we need to merge the local graph on each foreign server into a global graph on master node. Next, the node is not a single Postgres process. It's a process group. And thus, we use distributed transaction ID to represent a node instead of PID. The node in wait for graph has four main attributes. First one is a distributed transaction ID. The second is a list of the out degree edge. The third is a list of integrate edge. The fourth is a PID and the session ID information for the waiter and the holder node. The from node is the waiter. The to node is the holder. The edge in the wait for graph represents a blocking relationship on any segment. Edges also has four main attributes. The first one is to vertex, which holds the lock. The second one is the from vertex, which waits for the lock. The third one is the edge tab. Not all the locks are released at the end of transaction. For example, the top lock and the relation lock, which is closed with the 
specific log mode. These logs could be released in a local segment without the need to wait for the distributed transaction to commit. We call this kind of fake blocking relationship as dotted edge. The other one is a real blocking relationship, and we named it as solid edge. Later, we will show the different processing for these two kinds of edge in global dialog detector algorithm. The first one is blocking relationship lock mode and lock tab. This is on the above global width for graph. Let's see how does cluster handle the global dialog. The basic idea is as follows. A dedicated background worker on master will build global width for graph periodically by querying the cluster. And then nodes and edges, which are not related to the dialog, will be removed. Repeat this process until no dialog or edge could be removed. If there still exists an edge, then global dialog exists as well. And we need to choose a session to cancel. Let's dive into the above steps in detail. To build with for graph, we need to gather log information on each segment. This is a two steps procedure. Firstly, it uses Postgres internal function get log status data to fetch a log waiting relationship from proc log shared memory. We need to extend the log instance data struct to include the distributed transaction ID and the log hold till the end of transaction flag. Next, background worker needs to gather the local log information from each foreign server and form a global graph. Each local graph entry should include the following attributes. The segment ID, log, waiter and holder's distributed transaction ID, flag to indicate it's a solid edge or dotted edge, and also some additional attributes like PID, session ID, log tab, and log mode, which cover the four main attributes of node and edge in the previous slide. Next step is eliminating unrelated node and edges. We could use a heuristic grid algorithm. It has two strategies. One is grady on global graph, which means delete all the nodes whose out degree is zero and also delete their corresponding edges. Here is an example on global graph. Node D has no output degree, so it is moved. Then node C's out degree also changed to zero, so node C is also removed. The other strategy is greedy on local graph, which means find all the dotted edge on each local graph. If dotted edge pointed nodes out degree is zero, then blocking relationship represented by this dotted edge could disappear ahead of the transaction ends. So we could also eliminate this kind of dotted edge. Here is an example. Note C out degree on global graph is one, but on segment zero's local graph, the out degree is zero. So we could remove dotted edge from node A to node C. The last step of global dialog detector is to break the dialog. Since we use a centralized detector, unlike PostgreSQL's local dialog detector can only e-log error itself, we could choose to cancel any session based on our policy. Common policy includes cancel the latest session or cancel the session whose resource like CPU and memory is very high. We have introduced the overview and algorithm of global dialog detector. At last, let's look at two more cases to better understand how global dialog detector works. We create 
a partition table T1 on a foreign server cluster and insert some data. Some of them are on server one, while others are on server two. Our first case includes three concurrent sessions. Session C will firstly update tuple with ID equals to two, which will hold XID lock on server one. Then session A will update tuple with value equals to three, which will hold XID lock on server two. Then session B want to update tuple with value equal to three or ID equals to two. It will be blocked by both session A and session C on server one and uh, server two separately. Finally, session A want to update tuple with value equals to two, which is on server one. Note that when session B failed to acquire the XID log on server one, it will hold the tuple lock to ensure the update could continue after session C release the XID lock. As a result, session A will be blocked by session B on tuple lock. Note that tuple lock will be released before distributed transaction ends, so it is a dotted edge. The original width for graph is on the left, and the global graph contains a circle before doing elimination. Now let's see how to eliminate unrelated node. Firstly, node says global out degree is zero, and we could remove this node and the corresponding edges. Now, on local graph of server one, the dotted edge 2.b has no out degree, so this dotted edge could also be removed. After removing the dotted edge, node A's out degree becomes to zero and could be removed. Finally, node B could be removed as well. There is no edge in the graph, so no global dialog in this case. Our second case also includes three concurrent sections. Section C will firstly update tuple with ID equals to two, which will hold XID log on server one. Then section A will update tuple with value equals to three, which will hold XID log on server two. Then Session B want to update tuple with value equals to two. It will be blocked by session C on server one. And then session A want to update tuple with value equals to two, which is on server one. Like previous slide, session A will be blocked by session B on tuple log and form a dotted edge. Finally, Session C want to update tuple with ID equals to three, which is on server two. It will be blocked by session A on XID log on server two. Okay, now the original width for graph is on the top left. And the global graph contains a circle before doing elimination. Recall the previous slide, the original global width for graph of case one is the same as case two. The only difference is a local graph. Now, let's see how to eliminate unrelated nodes. Firstly, let's check the global graph. There is no node whose out degree is zero, so we could not remove any node. Next, let's check the dotted edge on local graphs. We have one dotted edge from node A to node B, but node B's out degree is not zero, so the dotted edge could not be removed. We cannot remove any node or edges, so global dialog exists in this case. From the above cases, we could conclude even if the global width for graph are the same, they could have different dialog detection results. That's all for the talk. Thank you for your attentions.
back with Essen and Hubert for the Q&A session. Go ahead, gentlemen. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Asim, and I presented the part one of the talk about distributed snapshots. And uh, I can read one question on IRC, which is, uh, let me read it out. Uh, Alexi asked this question, and the question is, first you compared Postgres Excel with single central XID service and distributed snapshots. But then you still assume that some master assigns global distributed XIDs, while foreign servers just maintain a, uh, while uh, foreign servers just maintain a mapping. So what's the difference? Is it seems uh, it it seems like a single entry point global transaction ID assignment as well, doesn't it? So the answer is yes. Uh, master is still a single point of failure. However, the foreign servers can continue to act as independent PostgreSQL instances, which means local transaction IDs can, uh, local transactions can continue to occur on foreign servers independently. But as long as the master is down, there can be no distributed transactions in the cluster, but foreign servers can, uh, but transactions initiated on foreign servers can continue to work as uh, as before. So that's the answer. 